G'day guys, Luke from Metsy. I've got Nick and Tyler over the back of my shoulder there. Uh, we just arrived at Deakin University. We're gonna use their climate chamber, so high altitude environment and then a high heat environment. Get Tyler to do some testing and see what happens to his acute responses, his oxygen deficit, steady state, EPOC, etc. So let's go take a look at what we're doing. Okay, so here's a very quick overview of the results from that control, all right, so the, the normal environment. You can see Tyler's VO2 max, 68 mils per kilo per minute. His max heart rate, 171, and 155.3 liters of ventilation. Liters of air, he's breathing in and out per minute at his max, at 360 watts of power. So very quickly, in the red, we have heart rate. In the blue, we have oxygen consumption. We can see a relatively linear correlation between the two. Um, as one go, goes up, so too does the other. He re reaches a max heart rate here at 171 and a, a max VO2 of 68, okay? Uh, other couple of things very quickly. Ventilation in the green here, you can see a general trend. Five minutes of, of steady state, close enough to steady state before we start to increase the, the power and we see a linear change there. And it really spikes quite high, quite sharply towards the end there. And we'll go through that when we talk about the comparisons. Last thing here, just to confirm the testing protocol, you can see here we did five minutes at 150 watts. And then after that, every minute, we increased the resistance by 30 watts until he reached his maximum of 360. So now what we're gonna do is get him to do the same test protocol in a high altitude environment, and then in a high heat environment, and we'll comp compare his acute responses. Okay guys, so we're at the Deakin University lab today. We're gonna to use their climate chamber. Um, today we're gonna to do a hypoxic environment. So we're simulating a high altitude environment where there's lower oxygen. Um, and then in the next video, we're gonna do a really hot environment. So get, get, get Tyler really hot. What we've got here is just a set point. So you can see here that, um, if you can see that, Nick, just zoom in here. So 14% is our actual oxygen in the, in the climate chamber. So normal environment's about 21%. So we'll reduce that by a fair bit. Um, the altitude is simulating 3,414 meters. So we're gonna get Tyler to go in, do a test, uh, a ramp test, and see how his acute responses differ. Now, reasons you might wanna use a climate chamber, specifically for hypoxia, um, you might not be able to get to the environment. So if your uh, Winter Olympics are on at the moment, depending on when you're watching this video, um, you might need to get used to higher in environments, but we don't have that in Australia. So you can come to a climate chamber and you can simulate that. Other things, endurance athletes might want to use it to chronically adapt. So rather than having to um, go over to uh, an event two weeks or three weeks prior to do a, an altitude training camp, you can just come, in your, you can sleep in your own bed, 
You can do your normal routine, but you can come to a climate chamber such as what we've got at Deakin uh, and get your training that way to get you more red blood cells and all that sort of stuff. We'll talk about that when we get to chronic adaptations. Let's go in here. I want to quickly show you, this is just stop working for me, one sec. This is what we call SpO2. It's just muscle oxygenation. It doesn't really matter. In a normal environment, it should be about mid to high 90s. So at the moment, you can see that's 95. Might be hard to see on the camera, 95 at the moment. Let's go into the chamber and we'll see what happens straight away. So currently at 96. So it might take 30 seconds to a minute, but what you can see quickly is this is already quickly coming down. function now so normal altitude but higher temperature so we've set at 35 degrees celsius and at 40 percent humidity tyler's going to do the exact same testing protocol and we're going to measure his differences in acute responses compared to hypoxia so high altitude and the normal environment a couple of reasons you might want to train in the heat uh, the major one being for athletes, they want to acclimate to the environment. So if they can't go over, let's say you, you might be racing over in Malaysia where it's hot and humid, if they can't go over for two weeks um, to acclimatise to that environment, you can come and do some training in a heat chamber, simulate that environment, and you need the main chronic adaptations of increased blood plasma volume um, and an increased sweat rate. So you might think that increased sweat rate is bad, well it's actually good because we've got that increased plasma volume, we're going to be able to effectively thermoregulate without becoming de Hydrated. So that's what we're going to try today. Um, I've got a digital thermometer that goes in Tyler's ear, so let's just get a baseline measurement of that and then we'll get him set up. Yeah. 36.2 is his baseline, and we would obviously expect that to go up due to exercise and also being in a really hot environment. Okay, so now we're going to compare the normal environment compared with the high altitude environment and the hot environment. So in the blue, we have our high altitude environment. It's called hypoxia, so low oxygen concentration. Normoxia is our control trial, so when it's just a normal environment. And in the gray, we have our hot trial. This is our oxygen consumption. So what you'll see is Tyler's VO2 max was identical between the uh, the normal trial and the hot trial. So what that means is his performance was the same. It wasn't negatively affected by the heat. And the reason that's the case is because he was only exposed to the heat for about 12 minutes. He was able to effectively thermoregulate over that 12 minute period. And we saw that his, his core body temperature, although it increased, it never got above 38 degrees. Um, and we're not gonna start to see that thermoregulatory fatigue until sort of 38 and a half, 39 or above. So if he did that for, for two hours, he definitely would have fatigued. But uh, what we're saying is that uh, he was able to effectively cool himself. 
Compare this to the high altitude environment, you can see that he lasted a full minute less. Okay, his, ox his VO2 max was lower. Um, and he lasted a full minute less. So let's talk about why. So the reason being here is that we, we saw that we were only uh, were only exercising in a 14% oxygen environment compared to what is normal at 21%. So because there's less oxygen in the air, we're going to see all of his acute responses um, increase. So let's take a look at his ventilation now. What you can see is um, the high altitude environment and the heat and the hot environment he had elevated ventilation all the way through, but he had significantly elevated ventilation in the high altitude environment. Um, and the reason he had uh, significantly higher ventilation in the higher altitude is because, as we said before, there was less oxygen in the air. So he needs to breathe in more air because he's getting less oxygen in that air. Um, and as a result, he's going to have to breathe more and more in to try to get the same amount of oxygen. Even though the VO2 was fairly similar throughout, it was, it's very similar all the way throughout. Even here, it's almost identical normal environment compared to the high altitude environment. But he had to breathe in a lot more air to get that same oxygen consumption. So that means he gets to his maximum ventilation at a lower intensity. All right? So he's not able to, to, to increase his overall oxygen consumption. Um, when we come to heart rate, we can see that compared to the normal environment, we have significantly elevated heart rate for both the hot environment and the high altitude environment. The reason it's higher for the hot, for the hot environment is due to um, the redistribution of blood flow from the working muscles to the skin. So we see a higher heart rate because Tyler needs to work harder so that he can supply his muscles with oxygen, but also um, send blood to the skin to allow him to thermoregulate, to allow him to sweat. Now, as we said before, although heart rate was higher, it didn't have a negative effect on his performance in this trial because it was only 12 minutes long. He was able to effectively sweat and effectively thermoregulate and not have any negative performance effect. Again, if it was longer, hour, two hours plus, we would have seen a negative effect. And then for the high altitude environment, it's significantly higher throughout. Uh, again, same reason as, vent as his ventilation, there's not as much oxygen in the air, so he needs to breathe in more of the air to get the same amount of oxygen. But then from a cardiac output perspective, he needs to keep pumping the heart fast and pumping that cardiac output around at a, at a faster rate um, to get the same diffusion at the muscles and at the lungs. So um, in summary, Obviously, the, the best trial is going to be in the normal environment. However, that said, because it was only 12 minutes long, there was no negative effect by being in a hot environment other than having some increased acute responses, but performance was exactly the same. Whereas when we compare it to a high altitude environment, that was a significant decrease in his performance due to having less oxygen and therefore less contribution from his aerobic energy system, which goes to show why you should train high uh, sorry, sleep high and train low because Tyler wouldn't be able to um, train as effectively at high altitude as he could at lower altitude. Um, so if he can just sleep in that higher altitude environment, he's able to get those chronic adaptations of increased hemoglobin and increased mitochondrial mass and things like that. And then he can do all of his training at a normal environment to make sure that uh, the training intensity is optimal.